So hi, this is Tony Lowe from Physiopedia, and today we're really fortunate that we're joined by John Driscoll. So hi, John. Yeah, hello, Tony, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, uh, to have a chat with you and a conversation with you and all your subscribers or what, whoever you call it, members of uh, Physiopedia. Thank you very much. No problem, John. Um, so what we're going to be exploring today is this idea of reflective practice and clinical reflection. And when I was sort of researching this field, I very quickly came across you, John, on the internet because you've done extensive work in this area. But um, so for our audience, do you think you could just quickly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your story and how you ended up being so interested in this particular field? Yeah, I guess, um, and I guess the, the word that you used there, the operative word was story, because I guess reflection is about narratives. Um, it's about the individual. And uh, so I suppose where I should start is uh, saying that my background was nursing. Um, started off in mental health nursing and then progressed on into, into adult nursing. Uh, in those days, you needed to be doubly qualified to get any promotion, you know, uh, which I eventually did and uh, became a charge nurse uh, in intensive care. But uh, when I was working uh, in intensive care, um, I, I was just puzzled, you know, or, or just, perhaps I should rephrase that. Perhaps what I should say is that um, I was working in, in an environment for the first ever time where research was quite an important element of the work. And so when you came up with odd questions, uh, people didn't look down their nose at you. They were like, well, let's follow that up, you know. And um, the, uh, there was one of the things that I was interested in. We, we spent a lot of money in those days on these pressure-relieving mattresses, you know, uh, in intensive care. And what I'd found in my experience as a practitioner around the bed was that, um, you, know, it didn't, you know, it didn't seem to work. It caused us problems with ventilators and all the rest of it. So anyway, I started looking at that. And uh, I, went, I started off with these heady ideals, if you like, about... Um, does being on this mattress, uh, th does it uh, alter somehow the, the neurological status or enhance the neurological status of our patient? And so I was using, you know, in those days, Glasgow Coma School. Or whatever. Anyway, um, not unusually uh, with research, something else came up. And what it was, was that the, the mattress um, used to ride down the bed. Uh, and as the mattress rode down the bed, the, the patient would then um, occlude or slightly occlude some of their breathing apparatus and hence all their, um, you know, all their uh, um, observations, you know, would, would go off and, you know, their respiratory uh, things would be very high. And so, so that was that. So that ultimately, that was my finding. I did this other stuff as well. And um, anyway, the, the company uh, said, oh, right, you've got a bit of an issue with that, have you? So let's have a look at it. And what they did was they put a couple of straps, you know, on the back of the mattress so that the person wouldn't slip down the bed, uh, that they'd actually stay up and they could breathe on the, on the respirator, you know, on the ventilator. And, uh, and that, if you like, was the start of my, you know, uh, first, you know, that was my first publication, if you like, uh, as, a, as a very junior nurse. I had to cheat to get it published. And then in those days, people didn't really uh, publish very much about what they did. And this big hand of God came out of the sky <laughs> and said, right, come into education as a clinical teacher. So I started right at the bottom again and had to claw my way through um, nurse education. And when I was doing my teaching qualification, there was um, a module uh, that was looking specifically at questioning, questioning techniques and things like that. And uh, I became interested in... Uh, well, there was two things I was interested in. One, I was interested in this notion of um, experiential learning. Um, and secondly, I thought, well, if I've got a framework, uh, an experiential learning framework, um, the one, a very simple one that I used was do, review, learn, apply, um, how could we put questions in to try and get people around that circle or around that cycle? So that, so that, that framework already existed at that point? Well, um, we always used to talk about experiential learning as being, you know, somehow different, and it was more to do, it was more uh, based on experience, you know. So I suppose uh, the way that I would describe it is that um, I suppose with uh, more traditional uh, methods of education, what you might do is um, listen to a lecturer, a lecturer about all sorts of AMP, you know, to do with this, that, and the other, 
And then when somehow as a practitioner, you just simply try and apply that in practice. Um, but what interested me about this was you didn't start with that. You didn't start with the theory. You actually started with the person's experience, um, and hence the experiential learning cycle. So the starting point was the experience. Um, and then what happened then, if you needed to, you applied theory to that afterwards. So you started off, if you like, with this clean slate of experience and uh, just described, you know, if you like, what was happening. And, um, and then gradually worked your way through. And then you may come to a point at which you thought, oh, right, there's a limitation here of my knowledge or whatever, and then I'll go and explore what might be appropriate. So that was really the, the basis of, uh, and that was, you know, that started, if you like, my um, relationship with reflective practice, which really has been a lifelong companion, I have to say. <laughs> so, um, so I brought out this, uh, this uh, framework in 1994, uh, or published that framework called, um, you know, the what model of structured reflection. And, um, and people use it, and uh, people often refer to it as a, a good introduction, a very simple guide, um, and all the rest of it. And then uh, what happened was, um, you know, some years later, um, Professor Gary Rolfe, um, he came up with Bolton's model, Terry Bolton's model. And what was interesting about that was, um, in those days, I hadn't really, you know, I'd researched as much as I could, you know, uh, for, for what I was doing, uh, and obviously for the article and publishing it and all the rest of it. But it wasn't like today. We just take it for granted today that we just go on Google and we get access to, you know, tons of information, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and actually, he um, made me aware, if you like, that there was a, that there was a person called Terry Bolton who who'd actually brought out some work um, in 1970 in a book called Reach, Touch, Teach, uh, which obviously I wasn't aware of in those days. And um, and there he coined what, so what, now what. And so, you know, I, you know, I'm constantly asking my, you know, students and stuff to, you know, to sort of be critical and question, you know, the theory and all the rest of it. And they just, you know, tend to use the model blindly along with other models, you know, like a recipe book approach, you know. And, um, and so I suppose one of the, one of the challenges that I'd like to see is not only, hey, use it, you know, um, did you have any difficulties or what were the challenges, you know, but also comparing, if you like, with the literature and, um, and, Terry Bolton's model actually was a curriculum model for education. So it was like bigger picture, um, you know, looking at the development of education in schools, if you like, for, you know, for, for pupils. And so it, he tried to build the whole curriculum around a reflective curriculum, which was really innovative. And, um, you know, 1970. And there I was in 1994 having published uh, this uh, model. And I remember um, there's a chap called Ian Cliff. <clears throat> and we were sitting in the tea room over a coffee, and I'd sort of got the what and so what, uh, you know, the what and so what. In other words, what will happen and all the rest of it. So what, why is that important? And I really struggled with that last bit. And I said, Ian, I just need that last question, you know, that big question. And he said, well, what about now what? Oh, oh brilliant, you know. And so I was horrified, really, to think that, uh, you know, I hope people didn't think that I'd plagiarised that work, I suppose. I hadn't plagiarised that work. I wasn't aware of that work. Um, and all I would say is that I suppose my framework was really geared towards practitioners in the trenches, and it wasn't some you know big uh, you know some, some big you know curriculum development model or, or anything. It was just really trying to be uh, pragmatic, if you like, about how to go about doing reflective practice. So could you very briefly take someone who's never met your model just mm. through that process of how you would apply your model in a, in a reflection? Well, I'd just say get on Google. <laughs> these, days, <laughs> these days you'd say something like that, wouldn't you? No, I suppose, um, I suppose uh, where I would start is by uh, saying that uh, all reflective models um, have some element of description. Um, you have to describe what's gone on before you can then start analysing it or thinking about what you can do about it and, uh, and all the rest of it. So, the, so from, you know, from my point of view, my framework, uh, the what was really important. And what I did was uh, attached certain questions underneath that, that word what, you know, like what happened and you know, things like that, and, and try to get people to describe it in some detail. Is it important how long people spend doing that then? Well, 
It's very interesting that, Tony, because you know, sometimes I think, you know, we think routinely, you know, we, and, uh, you know, we get a problem, something happens, you know, we, uh, if we get a chance to stop, which I think is a very interesting thing about can we stop, you know, these days. Uh, everything's really fast moving, you know, and it's about taking time out and, uh, and all the rest of it, which, which I think is one of the challenges, if you like, of reflective practice. So it's almost like um, perhaps reflection is a bit like a dinner party event, you know, where you get the posh cutlery out and uh, you get the napkins. And, and I suppose, really, it's about making a little bit more effort than just going up the road and getting fish and chips, you know. Um, or it might be the difference between um, going to a coffee house and having some really lovely coffee beans that you have to wait, you know, um, at the counter for them to be you know, go through the machine uh, versus, if you like, just getting a spoon in the instant coffee and slopping it in and stirring it up and just cracking it down. So, so in some way, I don't know if I really answered. Um, no, 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 that's good. So basically, like you say, the benefits in life do come from spending a bit of time on something. So if you do the instant coffee approach to reflection, the benefits, the coffee will be less substantial than, say... Yeah, I think, I th I think that's a, a great way of uh, describing it. Well done, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, 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 take, I'll patent that as a, as a reflective That's model. It. So we've got instant coffee reflection. That's it's, uh, more percolated than. Uh, yeah, okay, that's right. So I kind of broke into you when you were talking about like the description aspect of the framework. So maybe we should move on to the next, the next bit of the framework. Okay. Well, perhaps I should just restate again, as I said earlier, um, a model, um, an experiential learning model that uh, that I really did like was by Denison and Kirk. Or was it Kirk and Denison? Denison and Kirk. And they just came up with four elements. Do, so you have the doing bit. Um, then you have a review bit, where you look back at it afterwards. Um, then you have, um, from having reviewed it, you identify what learnings occurred. So it's do, review, learn. And then, by magic, you just apply that learning. <laughs> yeah. So within that sort of experiential um, framework, or experiential learning framework, and I have to say that um, a lot of um, a lot of models like Gibbs and um, ones that are very familiar are, are, are very much based on guy helping people go through the stages of this experiential uh, learning cycle. So my my you know my framework was the what. So that's really about the doing. You know what we are doing, what was happening. You know all the rest of it. The next stage is the review which is, if you like, the reflective bit, or starting on that reflective journey. And um, so for me, that would be, um, so what? Yeah. You know, what difference does that make if I, you know, if I did this or I did that? You know, so what? You know, I thought that, I don't know if you can see it on the... Uh, yes. <laughs> you know. And that really starts the analysis, if you like, and, um, and perhaps identifies certain, certain things that, uh, that come out of that. And then the next element of my framework, so, so within, within each component, my three components, what, so what, now what, um, you can, uh, I've, I've put some trigger questions, if you like, to help the person go around. And then the final bit is the now what, which is the critical bit, uh, which is, you know, how are you going to sort of modify uh, what you've been doing then based on having gone through this process? Yeah, yeah. And... Um, I suppose sometimes, you know, what I've done when, you know, I suppose I've always got this tsunami of uh, scepticism about reflective practice, you know. Yeah, well, I didn't and, mean to bring that up, but now you've brought that up. <laughs> and I've had to swim through that for all of my, you know, educational life. And um, sometimes if, I, if I'm starting to do something on reflection for the first time, I just refer uh, to something like this. And I don't know if you can see what I'm holding up. Um, it's something that often... Um, is in, I don't want to be sexist or genderish or whatever, but you often find them in ladies' handbags. And what it is is like a little compact mirror. Yeah. And so uh, what I say is, you know, why would you, why would you look in that mirror? What are you doing, you know, when you pull that mirror out? And so people might say to me, oh, you know, um, just getting some lipstick or, you know, just doing something with me mascara. The whole thing about it is, is that you're trying to improve. Yeah. And um, 
But then what I say is, that, well, that's fine. You know, that's great. That's um, stereotypical reflection, isn't it? We do we reflect on it. We look back. Um, you know, we try and, uh, and improve. But then I say that if you was to turn turn that mirror, offset it, what might you then see? And I suppose the only way I might be able to do it is by lifting up the uh, lifting up here. And I don't know as we pan round a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we perhaps see other things. Yeah. So we might see curtains blowing, we might see the trees blowing in the background. The point being is that it offers us another perspective. Yeah. And I think the thing with reflection um, is that <clears throat> quite often uh, we get stuck into the self-reflection. Yeah. And, and that is important because it's about self and it's about improvement and, uh, and all the rest of it. But quite often we don't appreciate um, those other um, he said, putting this away. We don't often appreciate the uh, other perspective or, or other perspectives that are available to us. So what I would say, you know, as a, as a precursor to sort of the application, if you like, whatever that is, of reflective practice in physiotherapist practice, might be it's quite powerful to do it alone, but I think it's even more powerful to do it with others. Um, where you get that different perspective or that, um, you know, the things that you might be missing with the, uh, you know, with what you've described or, you know, perhaps you've, only, you've got limits of where your own values are. And, and you know, it's nice to be challenged sometimes. Uh, and it's those moments that sort of make you stop and say, uh, you know, uh, you go, Ugh. So, it, so if you were to, to tackle something like a reflection in a group of people, would you use the same model? Would you use your sort of model or another model? Or was it just a conversation? I mean, how would you, like, practically tackle that kind of thing? Okay. Does it not matter? Um, well, well I, I do think it matters. I, th I think that you have to ask yourself, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of engaging in this process, whether it's alone uh, or with others? And um, I suppose the main purpose of reflection or reflective, if I can call it reflective learning, if you like, rather, rather than just reflection. I think reflection is just like that mirror again, you know, just see back and nothing changes. You know? um, the purpose of reflective learning, I think, is, um, is what you said. It's, it's uh, to try and identify learning and, um, you know, to, to try and move forward and, you know, improve. And I think the trouble is that um, certainly if I, if I use my students as examples, I, I will get back to your question about applying it practice in it. Yeah. Um, quite often, people um, their description is too scant. You know, there's not enough meat on the bone. Or um, when people do analysis, it's just very, very superficial, and um, you know, nothing really comes of it. People tend to stop at that point. You know. So this um, is when this is actually when they've written up the sort of stages in their reflection. That basically they're not writing enough. They're not sort of analysing or challenging things deeply yeah i mean i'll, I'll talk about uh an application if you like of reflective practice um you know for physiotherapy shortly whether that's portfolio development clinical supervision um, or, or whatever but uh, no i i think that uh, quite often uh, i think another barrier or a challenge to reflective practice particularly for people that are watching this might be actually it's a dry topic and secondly i've had a really bad experience with it so to go back to your original question about doing it in groups, I think it can be really helpful if, um, if it is facilitated in some way, shape, or form. There's no, way, uh, there, there's no reason why you can't have a reflective group um, and um, you know, go through different experiences and the group help that person move on and without telling them what to do, but just give them uh, questions to think about what they're doing. Um, and I think over a period of time, people get um, more used to disclosing uh, things about themselves, get more comfortable with that. They know that the feedback, although it might be challenging, isn't uh, destructive or it's constructive. Yeah. Um, but I think you have to get to that point first, you know. And I think the way, uh, the way forward with that is to actually have some um, experience with it yourself so that you can feel what it's like uh, to be... Uh, reflective or to engage in that reflective process. Yeah. So, you, so, you, so just, you just mentioned that you had an example, I think, for physiotherapy. It would be really good, I think, for, a, for, the, for my, my, our audience to really like 
dive deeply into particular, like a real example in physio, that'd be great. Yeah, okay. Well, I suppose one of the questions then might be, what should physiotherapists look like? And um, the answer that would come back to my imaginary audience, uh, I do reflect. I'm thinking all the time about what I do. Yeah. So, okay, so, so I'll accept that. So, um, you know, people do have to think about what they're doing. They're accountable, professional uh, practitioners. And quite often it's, it's very often about the technical aspects of their work. It's working within a policy framework. It's keeping the patient safe and, uh, and all of that stuff. Um, I think reflection uh, for physiotherapists, there's a big um, area for lifelong learning. So, in other words, when you've finished your course um, or, you know, and you're just working as a, uh, I didn't mean to say just working, but working as a, as a physiotherapist in practice, um, it can become a bit routine, it can become, and I, I just think that the notion of continuing professional development is excellent for reflective practice, because what it makes you out as a lifelong learner, there's no end point to learning. And, um, and I sometimes think, you know, for people that have been doing the, uh, uh, you know, the job for quite a long time, you know, perhaps there is, you know, there is an end point. I've got the knowledge, I've got, you know. So reflection can challenge that. And um, quite often the professional bodies, professional organisations, uh, if I think about the UK and the Chartered Society of, uh, of Physiotherapists, what they would say is that, you know, periodically uh, we want you to validate uh, who you are and, um, if you like, demonstrate some evidence of continually professionally developing and, uh, and maintaining, if you like, your registration. So I think uh, things like um, portfolios, or portfolio for me, there's, there's a word that runs alongside parallel with portfolios, and that is evidence. So most professional bodies, I would think, suggest that you keep a portfolio so you can tap into what you've been doing over a period of time, present that, and then you get revalidated. Um, but within that evidence, there's, there's a whole load of things you can include, conferences that you've been to, training that you've been on, um, certificates, uh, and all the rest of it. But I also think that reflection and reflective practice has a place, and, uh, and that can be just as, uh, just as valuable. So whether it's sort of personal reflection from time to time, or whether it's more formalized uh, reflection with others, I think uh, it shouldn't be dismissed, that evidence. Um, and so in, in that respect, it's a form of uh, written reflection, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I've been involved with uh, you know, uh, over the last 18 months, um, because ap apart from working in education, I, I also, I'm also a freelance as well. And uh, I suppose my specialism would be in reflective practice, but it would also be in an application of re uh, reflective practice that uh, we in the UK call clinical supervision and what uh, people in Canada, which is where I've been working, um, refer to it as reflective clinical supervision to try and differentiate it from other forms of supervision you know, that exist in practice. Um, and I think that there's some, uh, I, th I think that is really good evidence, if you like, uh, from a portfolio. I think it says things like, I'm interested enough uh, to take time out uh, from my practice, uh, in addition to what I do, to try and think about um, you know, my practice critically um, and, and go on that lifelong journey, you know, that lifelong road, if you like. So I think clinical supervision uh, is a great example, uh, and I think that uh, the use of um, portfolios as evidence, if you like, of professional development, of which reflections can be incorporated into, into that, and might be really helpful. So if, if I'm like... My last experience, I'm a clinician now, I'm putting my sh myself in the shoes of a clinician. My last experience of doing a clinical, well, a reflection of any sort was as a student. And I've now yeah. been in practice for a while. Oh, and, I'm, and I'm being asked to do it again. Now, when, how often, as a rule of thumb, should I be thinking about engaging in like formal written reflection? <laughs> or does it matter? And then also, I've attended a course and I've been introduced to a new, like several of these frameworks which you've mentioned. And like, how mm. do I choose one of these frameworks you know, to, to use when I do this, you know, is there, is there any sort of advice or are there any rules of thumb or? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole load of, a uh, whole load of questions for me that emerge from that. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the things is to go back to the student experience. Yeah. 
And, um, and so I would question, uh, having finished the course and all the rigors and all the worries, and you've got your, you know, you've got your um, qualification and um, what was that experience like? And it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a contradiction, really, uh, that I get put in a situation where um, I try to promote reflective practice with, uh, with students, if you like, and uh, try and get them to disclose and move forward and all the rest of it. But, and, and then I ask them to sort of produce, you know, I don't know, a thousand word or a 15 word essay. And then it's almost like I'm assessing them. So I suppose what, what, what we're saying here is, is there a, a right and wrong way of, you know, of, uh, of reflecting? And um, I, su I suppose really what, what I'm looking for with written reflection with students is that, um, is that they can give a, a, a good account uh, of what went on um, and then question why it's important. In other words, you know, what do I want to get out of put myself through, put myself through this, if you like. Um, and from a student perspective, I suppose, is where are the gaps? Where are the gaps in my knowledge then? Where have I got to go? Um, to try and improve this. And I think one of the experiences as well that students often have, and that I often see on paper, is that um, it's almost like uh, Christmas time, you know, where you've got all these presents under the tree. And I often think of, people often think of reflective practice and that process of going through all that, coming out the other end. Almost, they try to present me, or students try to present me, with um, a Christmas present. So, you know, they've got something inside and then they put the wrapping tape around it, got all the cellar tape and then they put the, you know, that bow on top and they present it to me. But actually, in reflection, it doesn't work like that because quite often you've only just started to apply the cellar tape. You know, people try and, people try and convince me that reflection is this process that has a beginning, middle and end and it's all tied up and lovely and we all ride off into the sunset. Uh, my reality, and I think probably students' reality is, that quite often what you find is that there are more questions than answers. Um, and what I'm trying to get students to do is try to apply some theory. Go to the theory and see if there's any way that that thing that cropped up uh, that they can improve upon. Perhaps I need to go somewhere, you know, to, you know, to, inf you know, to make more informed judgment, if you like, uh, about, uh, about what's what. So I suppose when we're now faced with um, a qualified physiotherapist, um, I, I suppose... Having, I have done some clinical supervision <laughs> with physiotherapists, and, uh, and I have to say that they're really interested in stuff like the technical elements of their practice, of which I know nothing about, which is great, because I can ask really stupid questions and, uh, and get them to think about it, and, you know, they huff and puff, and surely you should have known that. But, it, you know, it just stops them in their tracks a little bit. So there's an issue there about, do I, you know, does the person that guides the reflection do they just need experience in guiding reflection, or do they need experience in that practice? And also probably both, but um, physiotherapists wouldn't spend time, you know, perhaps coming to, to me for clinical supervision because they'd think, oh, he doesn't know enough about my world and my physiotherapy work, you know. Um, but having said that, I think that, uh, that there's a lot that, that um, people can do with reflection beyond registration. Um, I think stereotypically, uh, people often use reflection, it often crops up, um, we often say things like the itch that you can't scratch, or something triggers um, a reflection, uh, so that might be an uncomfortable moment, or, or, or you go off to you and you think, oh, I wonder if I did the right thing, there. there's something like a worm going around, but there's something that's unresolved, now that's perfect for reflection, and, um, and of course the other thing about it is that um, uh, when you talk about reflection, I, I think there's, you know, there's probably three ways you can you can do reflection. I suppose um, with myself and, uh, and you, Tony, uh, as, as you well know, and now my audience all well know, this is my first Skype interview. So I'd actually uh, thought about that, contacted you. We had a little experiential play uh, and all the rest of it, and um, I tried it on a couple of other people. So I was happy to do it, you know. So you can... And you can also say things like um, going for an interview. You can reflect on past interviews. You can talk to other people, and you can prepare. So, so in some respects, reflection, although it's stereotypically always after an event, I think you can bring some of this stuff in before an event. 
Um, and then uh, the, the other type of reflection, which Donald Sean refers to, is reflecting in action. In other words, something's unfolding in front of your eyes in practice, um, but you've got the experience, the knowledge uh, to actually deal with it as it happens and as it unfolds. And you're not really thinking about, you know, perhaps too much about where it's come from, but you know that this, it seems right. Uh, I, I suppose I'll give the um, um, experience of uh, what the... Um, Think of a, a ward sister um, who just looks at a patient and knows that they're what we call in the trade going off. Now, there's nothing on the outside that would suggest that something's happening. But that experienced practitioner would know that before it happens. And that's a really complex form of reflection uh, that I don't think we're going to today. But um, Donald Sean refers to it as reflecting in action, as the action unfolds. But the reflection that we're talking about um, today is re uh, what Donald Sean refers, refers to as reflecting on action. In other words, we go back to it afterwards. So in the cool light of day, without all those pressures around us with the alarms going off and uh, people staring at us or someone shouting, you know, we can come out of that situation and we can look back at it uh, a bit more meaningfully. Um, and what that takes, of course, is the ability to stop. And quite often we don't because we're into the next thing. And that's where I think um, uh, the potential for learning is lost, particularly post-qualification, because we don't seem to go back to, um, to those, those moments because it's filled, the, the space is filled then with something else. So, um, so, so quite often uh, reflection comes on us, if you like, uh, as a bit of a surprise. You know? um, and we can sort of shrug our shoulders and move on to the next thing, or we can stop and explore that. Uh, and that's where I think it's really useful. And that's where I think it can be um, useful, not only to be alone thinking about it and uh, getting worried over it, feeling stressed over it, continuing to feel stressed over it, you know, but to actually disclose it with others. We perhaps have got similar experience, more experience. I mean, you, you know, Tony, when you're working in groups, after you've got, the, got over this initial disclosing, you then find it quite reassuring to find that other people have had that similar issue. And the time and time again in clinical supervision, uh, that comes out where people sort of keep themselves hidden. But then when somebody's willing to disclose, then other people will. So I think that um, uh, reflection uh, with others uh, is, is, a, is a really powerful thing to do. Yeah. Now, this is, I, mean, this is all, I think this is all very helpful and useful. I mean, it's obviously, it's it, nothing about this is like clear cut, you know, it, it feels to me like basically with reflection, it's a, up to you to feel like the moment is right. Like it's not like you need to do one every six months on, on put, no. and set a deadline in your calendar. You can't do that. No. And then also, I mean, another question I have really is about when you're say writing, I mean, obviously you can, you can go through these processes without actually writing anything down in your group, it'll be largely a discussion. But when, like, say, a member organization uh, requires of its uh, members to do reflective practice, they are generally looking for some kind of written. And then, okay. so, so when yeah. you are, yeah, so when you are writing, I mean, I, I guess it depends, it depends on you writing for as to what you then get out of the writing. And I guess this, you referred to this when you talked about your students in that they were, yeah. were writing very much because they thought they were being assessed, whereas... My understanding oh, so. is, is your benefits as a reflection, depend, you, want, you really want to write for yourself. Okay, what I would say is you can't reflect on everything. You haven't got time to reflect on everything. So what I would uh, say to, um, you know, to the physiotherapists that are watching this is just have a, have a think, about, think about significant experiences. Um, and another element, you know, from a reflective point of view that, um, that can be very powerful and that is to start off with your life, uh, start off your reflections by describing what happened. But really concentrate on how you felt at the time. And this inner expression of uh, feelings, uh, again, we tend not to disclose to others. Uh, we keep it to ourselves. And, um, and it can be very interesting to actually have a look at um, how we were feeling at that time. The emphasis on reflection, on the written reflection or whatever, is about you. 
Um, and the way round that that my students have found, or they try, is to then talk about what happened. Um, they, they do star in that little description, but then they then refer and analyse it to others. So it, there's always somebody else's fault. Over there. <laughs> you know, there was other people that caused that. There was these factors. But then they, they forget, if you like, actually it's about me. So you, you raise a good point there, uh, Tony, because what is the purpose of reflection? And um, the purpose, if you like, is to learn. Uh, what have I learned from this situation? What have I learned from this, if you like, experience or significant experience? And, um, and it takes effort. It takes uh, effort to do that. And um, so, so therefore, I would say go for a, meaning, a meaningful uh, experience, something that's significant. Something that happened recently that was significant. So that, and, and again, I, I think I referred to it earlier on, that there's a stereotype uh, with reflective practice um, that we tend to look at things that go wrong or things that we didn't do or shortcomings. And, and I have to say that that is very powerful, you know, especially working with others. And then look at what the evidence is with the rest of the group that, oh, no. But, what can also be very powerful is to look at positive things. What went right with, with that particular patient, that particular scenario or whatever? And why would we do that? The purpose of that would be to try and get it again or, or, or get, you know, improve upon it even more. So once you start applying that in a group, um, you know, in a departmental uh, situation, the possibilities are endless there for improvements to practice. But most people would just go for the, the bad option and, you know, it's almost like being in a confessional box, you know, where, you know, the reflection, you confess all your sins, you get your absolution and off you go, you know. But, the, uh, but you know, I, th I think particularly with uh, group clinical supervision, um, I, I think that can be very powerful. And I suppose, interestingly, it poses one of the biggest challenges uh, for reflection in, in, in organisations. Um, and that is, you know, not, I won't say not conforming, uh, but challenging the status quo. And I think there's a thin line, isn't there, between being comfortable enough to challenge what's going on, perhaps with medics, perhaps with other multidisciplinary professionals, uh, the organisation itself. The intention is to improve, but there's a thin line, I suppose, in, um, in constantly questioning something that's going wrong. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, it can make you very unpopular. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So um, just... and, but but the, the counter side of that is if you don't, then you just end up being very uh, conforming. I think this group think, you know, within organisations can actually limit uh, the potential of organisations. And I think you touched on this earlier in that it is lifelong learning and organisations are the same in that if, if an organisation stops changing, it dies, you know. Yeah. Everything needs to develop and be challenged and to you know, continue to change and evolve. And this is one of the processes by which that, that happens. So if I look at the experience of uh, implementing um, what they called uh, in, uh, in Canada, um, in New Brunswick in Canada, the Department of Health, working with them, they wanted to implement a model of clinical supervision. And uh, they had tried unsuccessfully. And the existing uh, models there were you know, it tended to be top-down, um, it tended to be more managerial or what they refer to um, as uh, administrative. And what they wanted was something different. And so uh, it took a long time. It took a long time, but we came up with this idea of reflective clinical supervision. But didn't, um, it wasn't intended to be um, uh, purposely challenging to managerial type supervision because I think you do need those, you do need the managerial supervision, you need to have people that know what the boundaries are and uh, you know the, you know, the policies being adhered to and, uh, and all the rest of it but they wanted more of a reflective, so I won't say it was an alternative form of supervision, I'd say it was more complementary but what a challenge, what a challenge to the culture of their departments and their organisation to actually uh, the supervisee if you like brings in something to the group supervision space um, that's actually uh, they decide what it is that they want to talk about. And quite often what happens in management 
when we go to meetings and things like that, management decide what's going to happen, even if it's an appraisal or something like that. And then at the end, you get the last five minutes. Have you got any questions? And really what that means is we're finished now. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so the culture change was really about um, people being uh, willing to go into a supervision space uh, that was safe, uh, that they had some guidelines, that done some training beforehand, but they were able to talk about their practice in a safe, uh, safe enough space with the intention of learning about it and trying to improve on that. And so the, the supervision space uh, then became, if you like, um, sort of ongoing, ongoing development. And, um, and there'll be people within that group um, that are also, that they're all um, peers, if you like, and um, which some people would argue, well, actually, they can only see as far as their end of the note, you know, with peers. But believe me, peers can be very helpful because um, you tend to listen to your peers more than, you know, perhaps you listen to them. So some, if one of your peers is saying, well, actually, you know, perhaps, you know, the way that you went about that might be, you know, or, or, or what often happens, Actually, your feelings about that, yeah, you couldn't, um, it wasn't a great situation to actually work in, but you did your best at the time. Uh, and uh, next time, perhaps we could just slightly improve that or think about the way that we communicated with uh, that person or whatever. So, that's, kind of through, uh, so that really is another example of how getting a group involved in reflective practice can really bring a lot of different perspectives and a lot more deep depth and challenge. Yeah. Can I just promote somebody? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, go for it. Uh, the person that I worked with uh, on this, and I'm still working with, actually, I'm, I'm still doing uh, group supervision uh, with them uh, in uh, New Brunswick in Canada, is a person called Cynthia Boyd. And if any of your um, um, people that are watching uh, just want to email me and get in touch, I can give further details. But interestingly enough, because the, um, the way that they developed it was from bottom up, rather than me going in there, it was all top down or, you know, they developed it themselves, and it, the process was longer, a bit like that, that uh, instant coffee version. Yeah. Uh, it took longer to get there, but actually it was more powerful. And she came up with a term uh, called the fire truck model of supervision. Right. And I think that is a fantastic metaphor for the type of reflective uh, supervision um, that I was trying to help them with and had, you know, had a bit of vision about. But they came up with that term. And what it meant was that um, uh, it was a place, I suppose if you look at uh, people that are in, in the fire service, okay, they go out, they, they go out, they do a job, they come back, and they, they've been in smoke-filled rooms and the place has been filthy. And they come back and they wash themselves down and they wash their fire trucks down and it's all done in working time. So in other words, getting rid of some of that stuff, um, you know, at the end of their at the end of their really busy shift, uh, in order to be able to then start afresh. And, and, and that, I thought that fire truck model was a, was a really great metaphor. You know, you can just imagine the, the scrubbing, the polishing, but applying that obviously to the supervision situation, um, that you can, um, that it's legitimized in work time, that's a really important element, but to stop, that you can stop and talk and think about practice learn about practice in, a, in some sort of space, whether it's 45 minutes, an hour or whatever, where people come together to actually talk about the practice. But it needs to be legitimized in practice because that would be the first thing that goes when people get busy. Yes. <laughs> and so it's a discipline. So they've, um, they've learned. I mean, uh, the people that I was working with tended to work with mental health clients. So um, I suppose in some respects they were very more fortunate because they worked out of diaries. And, and they were used to the idea that if you put a space in, uh, you put something in, then that's sacrosanct, and then everything else has to fit around that. Dependent, you know, it's not as easy to get rid of it. You know. So yeah, that's um, that sort of formalised reflection in practice under the auspices of you know, the fire truck model of uh, reflective clinical supervision. So we've covered a few models here and come up with a couple. Of, come up with a new one ourselves. So it's been it's been a really brilliant conversation. I think. Well, I've certainly learned a lot, and hopefully some of the people watching this interview will also learn. Are there any final messages, like going, like last bullet points that you'd like the audience to take away with them? Okay. Um, I think go back. Go back to those reflective experiences. 
you know, that perhaps uh, where you first started as a student, and have a think about why you know you felt that that wasn't so helpful or, or whatever. I think give it a go. Give uh, give it a go. Talk to one or two others uh, about is it, you know just talking, just talking about uh, practice. Uh, one of the things that I said about um, to this uh, group in uh, Canada was you know what, you know. You, you don't want all this theory behind it. Just do it, and then we can talk about it afterwards. You know, I think it's just about having a go. Um, the other thing I think is about having courage. It takes courage uh, to actually sit, stop, um, and look critically at your practice. And um, um, trust the process. That was something I was always saying in Canada. Trust the process, you know, and just see how that unfolds, you know, rather than... Um, uh, than having these big expectations right at the beginning. Um, and I suppose the other thing uh, about getting engaged in reflection is to think about, well, what is the purpose of it? Why am I going to put myself through this? Um, what is it that I want to learn? So I think identification of learning, trying to identify from those accounts what have I learned from it, and now what needs to happen for me to improve even further uh, is a big uh, element of it because I guess a lot of practitioners feel that they should already have the knowledge there. So why should they actually uh, learn further? And to identify learning is very powerful. It, um, and, and again, as I said, um, for most people, reflection would have been alone, sitting at a desk writing about, uh, you know, uh, but, but done with others can be very powerful. The other thing that uh, people can try is uh, if you just get, um, if you just get like, a little A5 or an A4 booklet with a, with a ring, ring spiral to it. Um, this is what I've used. Um, what I've tended to do is, is on the left, you can open up the book flat, can't you? Uh, on the left hand side, just write the more descriptive elements, what was going on. And then on the right hand side, keep that for more of the analytical bits. What am I learning? What am I going? You know, so, so you, and, and just by keeping a record like that, you can see your progress. Because after you've done you know, two or three of them, what you probably find is there are recurring themes that tend to come out of all of them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's uh, another story, I think, about why that happened. But, uh, um, that's brilliant. But, you know, I, I think don't, don't give up on it. Don't just put it to bed or, you know, just say, um, get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to email, have a Skype now. Well, wait, quick, yes, so quickly just tell people where they can find out more about you and what is it that you do? Because obviously this is your business. So what is it? what are the services that you do? Well, it's part, it's part of the business. I'm also um, a part-time lecturer as well, you know, doing uh, reflective practice and stuff. But um, I suppose my, my freelance consultancy work really um, is about um, reflective practice, change management, and, and this thing called uh, clinical supervision, which is all sort of linked in. I suppose if you want to put it under one umbrella, I suppose I specialise in continuing professional development beyond, if you like, uh, registration. Um, I've got quite an old website, need updating and all the rest of it, but there's quite a lot of resources on there. Um, and that is um, www.supervisionandcoaching.com. Okay, well, we'll, uh, put, we'll put a link in the notes around this so yeah and you can click there and email me um and i'm more than happy uh, to come out and uh, have a chat or or whatever or skype now or skype yeah <laughs> this is, uh, this is uh, endless possibilities now yeah. i mean you wouldn't believe that i've done group supervision on the telephone <laughs> you know where you've got about five or six people all phoning in at the same place and we're all you know. so skype yeah Thank you for helping me learn with that. No problem at all. Well, it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. And um, we'll hope, well, maybe we'll speak again at some point in the future. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and good luck to all the practitioners that are watching this. And, uh, you know, I really support your professional development.